to the SSS Council for inviting me here. Uh, unlike Kriti's very generous words, uh, I am no expert on, on Shabimala. I have uh, thought a great deal about it, like all of you. But I'm delighted to see such interest in this question. And uh, it is really the spirit of JNU that we have all cherished for so long. And I uh, look forward to your comments and no doubt your questions uh, after I say a few things that have occurred to me in the course of the last uh, few weeks. I would like to say at the outset that I'll move away from the political cacophony. I'll come back to the question of political towards the end of what I have to say. But since I have about half an hour, let me start uh, with a few other questions uh, by asking, first of all, what is at stake in Shabrimala? So, um, the place, uh, the, the controversies that have been generated have begun, as you know, with the legal question, which is the most important question that has arisen vis-a-vis -vis the Supreme Court judgment in which four judges favored overturning the tradition which disallows women of menstruating age, that is between the ages of 10 and 50, to uh, worship at Shabrimala. And there was, as you know in this judgment, a sole dissenting opinion offered by a woman judge. Let me just uh, uh, outline at the outset that Anjumahotra was making an argument that the suit was not maintainable because the parties demanding the change, that is to say the Young Lawyers Collective, were not themselves believers. So this is one of the arguments that she put forth in her dissenting judgment. Some of you may know that her dissenting judgment has been hailed by other uh, scholars of jurisprudence as much as it has been uh, critiqued by other kinds of scholars. But uh, to just summarize very quickly, she uh, starts off by saying that the suit is not maintainable since the parties demanding the change are not themselves believers and that constitutional morality cannot prevail over beliefs and practices of a <coughs> sub-religious group which are, you know, these are matters that are internal to religion. In other words, she is suggesting that dissent within religion has to be, in some ways, sorted out by the adherents themselves, without the intervention of something like state law. So, of course, we can begin by asking this question about how does one dis d deal with dissent within <coughs> religions? Uh, and what is the space of the law in this? Uh, Malhotra herself is saying that courts cannot deal with the question of religion unless, and she makes a very interesting qualification here, it is pernicious, it is a pernicious practice, and she gives the example of sati. She says that would be the kind of pernicious religious practice which calls for the intervention of the law. So, uh, uh, it's interesting that she gave this example, and I'll come back to it uh, a little later. Now, uh, there are two problems with the parallel that she gives of, for example, the pernicious practice of sati. Because we now know, especially after 40 years of feminist historical scholarship, that the organization of opposition to the practice of sati beginning from the late 18th century, taking force in the early decades of the 19th century, very rarely that form of cultural nationalism which ended in the abolition of sati in 1829, very rarely took the actual feelings and beliefs of women on board. It was a debate which was largely conducted by and between men, whether they were missionaries, whether they were colonial administrators, or whether they were Indian cultural nationalists. 
We all know this, especially from the seminal work of people like Lata Mani. Um, so it was a transformation which was enabled in part because of the kind of embarrassment about Indian religion that was engendered by colonial officials. But more important than that history is this, uh, the, the assumption by Judge Malhotra that religion and society are somehow two watertight <coughs> silos or airtight silos if you like. Uh, that, you know, there is a sphere of the religious which is somehow separate and distinct, uncontaminated by the kinds of hierarchies, discriminations of which our social life is uh, marked, by which our social life is marked. They are not two watertight or uh, airtight silos. Uh, and this is, in fact, exactly what Justice Chandrachud suggested in his judgment, citing Allari Krishnaswami, and he says, that is to say, Allari Krishnaswami said that there is no religious question that is not also a social question. If we look at it that way, then of course the practice speaks of discrimination against women, it is, of course, once more asserting, and this is important for us to understand, that women can only be the bearers and not the makers of cultural identity. They must everywhere be marked, but not be themselves the makers of cultural identity. And therefore, it is difficult to disentangle I would say, the uh, social from the religious in this instance. Chandrachur actually focuses <coughs> on this, Justice Chandrachur, when he says that there were two kinds of struggle which led to the uh, writing and um, establishment of the Indian <coughs> Constitution. One, of course, is the one we are more familiar with, the political struggle which wanted to end in granting equal rights to all citizens in the Indian nation. But the other, he says, one which was equally important was the social struggle waged by people like Dr. B. R. Ambedkar for social and not just political equality. So in some ways he is asserting that the Constitution as a document is actually envisioning not just political equality, but also social equality, and therefore has a, uh, an opportunity to intervene in the <coughs> sphere of something which seems to suggest that there are categories of purity and pollution that are operating to keep women away during a certain period of their lifetimes from worship at this important uh, religious site. Just today, uh, the Hindu has carried an article by a former census uh, commissioner, S. Jai Shankar, who invokes, interestingly enough, the fundamental rights of Ayyappa himself as being somehow violated by the Supreme <laughs> Court judgment. And no doubt this kind of argument will also gather force in the days to come. Um, what Chandrashur is saying, just to, just to close that part of the argument, is that these questions are inseparable. <coughs> that is to say, there is no doubt. In other words, he's suggesting that something similar to caste discrimination is being uh, uh, practiced in the disallowance of women to this sacred site. Now, I should just mention here that we are today at a moment when we have been witnessing very successful legal challenges to, uh, uh, to certain kinds of sacred practices. Shani Shangnapur is one, uh, Haji Ali is another. These are recently won victories by women for the right to worship at very different kinds of religious sites. Uh, let me start by saying that this invocation of right 
is not against faith. In fact, the appeal is being made to law in order to enable faith. So let's get this straight. You know, I am saying this because for a very long time, and particularly in the early decades of the uh, feminist scholarship, I would say in the 70s and 80s, perhaps even in the early 1990s, there was skepticism about the role of religion in our social life by uh, Indian feminists. That skepticism gave way, I would say, in the early 1990s to a healthier respect for the kinds of uh, solace that religion offers to women uh, in countries like India. Uh, it was occasioned in part, the, the second thought, as it were, was occasioned in part by the demolition of the Babri Masjid, by the fact that there were large numbers of women who had been mobilized by the BJP at least two or three years previously, particularly during Sheila Nyas, to actually establish and build a new Ram temple. And these were women who acted out of what they believed was their faith. So we, we shouldn't have this kind of, you know, um, um, uh, impression that everything was machinations of uh, the Hindu right, but uh, rather there was something that was driving women to participate in this movement in ways that feminist scholarship needed to make sense of. I'm talking about people like Tonika Sarkar, Urushi Bhutari, and so on, who said we must try to understand what this phenomenon is. I think what happened at that moment was this recognition that faith, and religious faith in particular, is not fatally patriarchal. And it is in that spirit, I think, that we should understand the demand that is being made today for the entry of women to a variety of spaces that have hitherto been forbidden to women. I'm also saying this because I was last week at Guwahati to, at a young scholars conference and uh, there was a large number of young uh, people <coughs> from all over the country present there, almost a hundred young scholars. And uh, when I finished speaking, although I was not necessarily speaking about uh, Shabrimala, one uh, young woman came up to me very agitated and said to me, if, uh, if this place of worship does not want women to be there. Why are women so keen on going there? Why don't they leave religion alone? Why is it that they want to uh, participate in a religion which is clearly expressing such discriminatory uh, uh, processes? Uh, and it is a question that needs to be answered. You know, So I, I'm saying to you that I think today we are at a position where we have a healthier respect for questions of faith and for understanding that faith need not be fatally patriarchal and that those who have demanded a right to enter these places are within their rights as people who are faithful themselves to want to participate in worship. Now, uh, let's just go to the kinds of objections that have been raised since the judgment to uh, uh, what has actually happened. Uh, first of all, there has been this argument that uh, this is tradition. As I said to you, today's paper cites uh, oh, this uh, person called uh, Jai Shankar, who is uh, described as a, a very important historian, uh, who says this has nothing to do with gender discrimination but it has everything to do with tradition. Uh, and, but, but here I think we should stop and say to ourselves, remind ourselves, first of all, that especially vis-a-vis -vis the Ayapa temple, uh, and this is what I had written uh, one newspaper article about, these are traditions which appear to have been invented. And there is no, uh, there is no tradition which is uh, lost in the mists of time, like we would like to imagine that. And all of us as scholars here, we are all aware of the argument about invention of traditions. There is practically no aspect of the Shabrimala pilgrimage which is in some ways pure or true to some earlier ancient belief. Practically everything has changed. And I would say it has changed very dramatically in the last 
20 or 30 years, particularly as very, very large numbers of people from the four southern states, but also now increasingly from places like Orissa and Bengal, are beginning to frequent the place. I looked up this, uh, the figures for those who attend the uh, uh, Magarewalaka and Mandarewalaka, which is the season which begins uh, very shortly there from November to January. And the estimates vary from something like two crores to five crores. Now, this is not a small number. I could not verify this number, incidentally. I should, I should mention at the outset. But even if it is the lower end, even if it is two crores, it is a very large number of people who are going to Shabrimala today in this period. It means many arrangements have been made. The road has been paved. The steps have been covered with uh, uh, Pantaloha, which is this, this uh, alloy of uh, many metals, including gold, therefore making it impossible for the practice, which is perhaps a little older, of breaking the coconut in front of the Lord. And uh, there is uh, also various other kinds of restrictions that are being practiced in order to enable this very, very large number of pilgrims to visit the site. So there is not much, I don't want to repeat myself, but this is something I've already said in that article. But let it just be said also that one of the major ways in which changes have been made to the practice, because the insistence has been that women cannot perform the 41-day rhythm because they are themselves likely to have their periods in that period of 41 days, is that that period itself has been abbreviated in many cases where the mala is worn maybe just five days to a week prior to actually going to the temple by men. So all kinds of adjustments have been made in order to accommodate this very, very large number of male pilgrims. That's all I want to say, and we can have the rest in discussion if necessary. So there is nothing uh, which resembles perhaps some kind of pure practice which predates the last 20 or 30 years. Secondly, the question that has been raised is that this is a matter of faith and it should therefore be understood and settled uh, uh, you know, as a question of faith between those who are believers. But then the question we might ask is whose faith are we discussing? Because it, it seems to almost suggest that any woman who wishes to uh, go and worship at this temple <coughs> is herself faithless. It cannot be that she has any faith. Uh, this clearly is unacceptable because uh, this is precisely what the court uh, judgment was about. Who are the ones who, want to, who are aspiring to worship this court? Can, as uh, Justice Chandrachur very importantly pointed out, can the protection of Lord Ayapa's celibacy be a burden on women alone? What is it that is so precious about his celibacy that needs to be protected by the women alone? In other words, let's be a little bit more generous. And I want to say here that I think all the transformations that have happened in the pilgrimage have been tolerated by Lord Ayapa without any loss of faith on the part of those who actually visit this place. The third argument, the second argument that comes out is that <coughs> social reform must come from within. It cannot be brought from outside by courts and so on and so forth. And of course, one of the uh, uh, great uh, ways in which the uh, court judgment has been trumped is to say, look at the large numbers of women who are opposed to any change in the practice. And you are all aware that the BJP, in particular the RSS and other groups who are active in that region, have been very, very careful to position the women opponents in all the media and in the uh, photographs and so on and so forth in order to say it is not just men who are opposing <coughs> any change in this practice, but it is women themselves. And we need to answer this question because I think we need to uh, also say, and here again I would like to point to feminist scholarship which has shown over and over again that, of course, women are complicit with patriarchy in many instances. Patriarchy is not pure, dom uh, is not pure domination. It's also resting on the consent of very large numbers of women. We know this from all the compromises with which we are faced on a daily basis in our own lives. 
But let me just give you a completely different example, because we were hard pressed in the late 1970s and in the 1980s when the uh, anti-dowry murder campaigns were at their height to explain why it was that mothers-in-law were some of the worst perpetrators of violence within these homes. Of course, they had something to gain from the, the violence that they perpetrated on young daughters-in-law. That is not uh, that need not today surprise us so much. Uh, it is something we need to understand in the very nature of patriarchal power that it 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 functions by the com with the complicity of some sections of women. So that that is uh, in some ways to be answered that day, that way that women are the biggest supporters of the status quo. I would not say they're the biggest supporters. They are certainly have been made to look like the most visible supporters, but supporters they are in some cases, and we have to accept that and understand it rather than trying to take the easy way out and rather lazy way out of saying, you know, it is women themselves who are their worst enemies. Thirdly, and I think this is an important thing that has also come out, uh, uh, particularly in the interview, long interview with uh, Devendra Fadnavis uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, in which he was specifically asked <coughs> Why, if he had supported the entry of women into Shanishang Napur and Haji Ali, today the BJP is saying that uh, it is an internal matter and the law cannot intervene. And his answer was that social reform is of necessity a slow and gradual process. He is not saying that the demand of the women is wrong. He is not saying that at all, but he is introducing a new element in which he is saying it has to happen with the consent of all those concerned and that therefore it cannot be an overnight change as it has been introduced by a Supreme Court judgment. It is something that requires the work of getting permission and in some ways this is an interesting response because it is not actually saying that, you know, it's not talking about faith or even blind faith as it were, but rather opening the door to something that uh, allows for internal social reform. Now, forgive me if I'm a little skeptical about internal social reform. Since the 1980s, ever since the Uniform Civil Court debate has been challenged, in particular by forces on the Hindu right, insisting that there should be a uniform civil code, if only as a way of punishing the uh, Muslim population of this country. Uh, feminists have been hard pressed to uh, find al alternative ways of thinking about gender just laws. And one of the arguments that came up even within the feminist movement was that gender justice must come from reform within communities. Well. 40 years later, we are still waiting for that kind of internal reform. Certainly, it has not revealed itself uh, uh, so clearly. Many of the interventions, in fact, have come from state law. And uh, we don't know of too many examples of this gradual change coming from within the community itself. Fourthly, there has been another kind of interesting argument. Uh, this has been put forward, for example, by people like Rahul Ishwar who is insistent every time that he comes on television to say that there are temples where women are the principal devotees and men are not allowed. And he, of course, gives various examples. Uh, now, so, you know, this is just another variant, as it were, of Hinduism, that there is this variant of Hinduism which does not allow women to come in to worship, but there are equally a number of temples which don't allow men. Um, let me say here that it is very striking that what we are witnessing, particularly since the early part of this millennium, is a new kind of masculinization and corporatization of places of worship where female devotees were in power. And I'm not talking about large, well-known temple complexes like uh, Ayapa and so on and so forth, but much smaller ones. Uh, around Hampi, for example, in Karnataka, uh, I came across at least two such instances of women devotees actually being replaced by young male devotees to the extent of elbowing out the women out of their rightful place, the role they played, and so on and so forth. 
so devotees' power has been chopped down, but also female priestly power has been chopped down, as has been documented by Bhannati Kaluri in her uh, discussion of the pijinis of the Khons in Andhra Pradesh. I just cite these two examples, but there are any number of these instances of this very kind of new, I would say, new uh, masculinization that appears to be even taking over those locations where women had once enjoyed some kind of uh, 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 religious power. <coughs> okay, so um, I have just 10 minutes left to me, and uh, I would like to quickly uh, pass through to the question of what social reform histories have been in India to signal to you that the social, the, the question of reforming certain kinds of social practices, particularly in the 19th century, uh, whether it, and we all know this from our school history textbooks, you don't have to be a history major or even a, uh, a, a, any kind of specialist in history to know that there were <coughs> entangled histories of social and political change throughout the political, uh, sorry, the colonial period. Um, however, the women's question was somehow always uh, considered as something that was part of a social reform agenda, cultural nationalist agenda, a question in opposition called for. It is interesting that when, and this is shown to us by scholars like uh, Mnani uh, Sinha, that it was only in 1930 <coughs> that the social and the political actually attempted to come together in the demand for the transformations in the Child Marriage Act. But it was due to the threat posed by uh, Dalit's demand for separate electorates that women were asked to sort of withhold their political ambitions and once more one went back into this split between the social and the political. But Today, after more than a century of legal intervention in the social, to say that religion is above the law is to ignore all those who have actually benefited from the appeal to law. It also is ignoring a century in which the agentiality of women for change, both for change and against change, as we have seen just a moment ago, has been asserted. So, in the case of, so what is at stake? That's what I began by asking, and let me conclude by uh, saying uh, what I think is uh, at stake in this particular instance. One of the issues that is at the heart of this matter is, of course, the uh, practice of the pilgrimage to uh, uh, Shabrimala, which is a sphere of homosociality, which is very jealously guarded. Uh, the uh, anthropologists uh, uh, <coughs> Caroline and uh, Filippo Osella have actually studied the Shabrimala pilgrimage. Many have, but I will just cite their work. They have studied it in some detail and they have shown what an important part of this pilgrimage is the homosociality that it engenders, the kind of male bonding the kind of assertion of uh, a male privilege and anybody who has witnessed the trains full of Ayapas going towards Kerala in the season will know what I am referring to. Now it is not necessarily the same kind of virulent masculinity that is on display during the Kaudiya processions in northern India but there is certainly the outlines or the first signs, I would say, of the assertion of an angry Hindu masculinity as it has been nurtured in the Indo-Gangetic uh, uh, region for more than a century, now spreading in the same virulent form to other kinds, parts of India. This is not to say that there was no hypermasculinity in Kerala, not at all. In fact, there are very excellent studies today about the nature of the hypermasculinity in the region. And it is an interesting uh, point to remark, and I hope uh, my colleague will say a bit more about it, that there is a very uh, marked regional uh, hypermasculinity which has resisted uh, uh, re-socialization even by 
you know, uh, long tradition of Marxism in this region. This has been pointed out by a variety of scholars, not necessarily feminist scholars, but especially feminist scholars. So I would say that what we are witnessing is actually a warning to women. Uh, a warning to women to remember their place. And Shabrimala as a sign to uh, suggest that women should uh, remember their place. And this is happening, I would say, out of a certain degree of panic, almost. Because uh, there, is, there, are, uh, there are too many signs today that the individuation of women in India has happened at a much faster pace than the individuation of men. What is interesting about this, this homogenizing that is happening at one level, so at one level it seems like there is a certain kind of homogenizing of this hyper-masculinity. On the other, the interesting point about the Shabrimala case, which we need to keep in mind, is that for the first time maybe, uh, uh, to my knowledge at least, Hindutva is actually making a case not for homogeneity, but for exceptionality. That is to say, here is a, 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 a case of a particular regional practice which needs to be protected. Uh, it should not be brought under the you know, sweep of what we know as, as national Hinduism and so on. It should be protected precisely <coughs> for the features that it displays as a local regional practice. I'm suggesting this is not an accidental uh, kind of uh, warning that is being issued to women. Uh, it is not accidental, for example, that the Akhil Bharatiya uh, uh, Sant Samiti just yesterday <coughs> has called for the protection of not just the nation, but of Hindu Sanskriti by protecting Behen and Deity. So, you know, women, once more, must be and continue to be the bearers of this cultural tradition. They must bear the burden of this tradition without any transformation or change, without any question. Uh, and they must not, therefore, be open to the winds of change. Um, Kerala is one of the uh, locations which has seen a very long period of uh, uh, high uh, educational levels attained by women, high organizational levels <coughs> attained by women, both at work and, it's, for example, it is one of the earliest locations to have a sex workers union, if I can give an example, an autobiography by Nalini Jamila, which is... Uh, Sex Workers Autobiography, The Kiss of Love uh, Movement, which happened, the defiance of an entrenched uh, film actors union, etc. We have seen many signs that there are, uh, that women in Kerala are not willing necessarily to take it as it is being delivered to them anymore. At the same time, we should not neglect the fact that it is one of the most uh, hyper-masculinized regions of India. And at this juncture, what we're witnessing is something of a backlash. So let me just end by reminding you about something. The BJ, and I'm coming back to the political, which I said I would uh, perhaps not uh, uh, get sidetracked by at the beginning of this brief talk. In 2016, Bhayaji Doshi had said that entry of women into temples particularly Shabrimala, should be allowed even if it is a thousand year tradition. Okay? So here is Bhayaji Joshi himself, who is today at the head of the demand that no tolerance will be shown for Supreme Court judgment intervening in such practices, was somebody who said to the Akhil Bharti Pratinidhi Sabha in uh, Nagaur in 2016 that women should be allowed into temples and places of worship regardless of the antiquity of that tradition. What has made them change their minds? Uh, it's not just him, it's also an RSS functionary uh, Parmeshwar who said, uh, of the Shabrimala Vichar, <coughs> who said that there is no reason to ban women in Shabrimala. What has changed? We need to ask what has changed? in the last few months that has led to such a serious revision of a position that they had very firmly made, uh, taken. Is this a dress rehearsal for the Ram Temple, where once more we are being told that faith is above all adjudication of the law? Or is it simply 
or not simply, but uh, importantly, uh, a backlash against the, the, the demand that women are making to be uh, allowed to express their faith by being allowed into a space like the Shabriya temple. Now, it seems like this, this fear of menstruation, by the way, I should just mention also in passing, is this very, very primal fear. Those of you who are uh, students of anthropology will know that the fear of menstruation is something which is marked in many societies. And uh, we are no exception because it is bleeding without being wounded. And there is an element of mystique about it. It is not an affliction, it is not an illness, and yet it is something that is a part of your life cycle. Something which has challenged, as it were, uh, those who, who, who actually um, fear uh, feminine power. Um, and, and let's also be clear about one more thing, and that is that we have, uh, so this is the other thing that I forgot to mention, which is constantly <coughs> thrown in our faces. We have, in India, we are told, a large number of female goddesses, uh, goddesses, that is, who are worshipped, and therefore it cannot but be that women are held in very high religious, cultural, and social esteem. But let us remember that both the worship and the degradation are fashioned by patriarchies. This is something that we need to understand most importantly. Even if you take the Bhagavad worship in Kerala itself, it is dominated by men. Uh, there is no feminine principle that is at work amongst the devotees of Bhagavad which is one of, who is one of the most important goddesses in Kerala, very bloodthirsty, but nevertheless someone whose malefic power is uh, invoked largely by, uh, by men. Let me conclude this, therefore, by saying why the turn to the Constitution. Because we need a new political language, we need to imagine a new social, and it is very clear that feminism has not found, at least to my knowledge, any kind of tradition or myth <coughs> or uh, received practice which is, uh, uh, you know, which is empowering to women, in spite of the large number of goddesses that we have because our myths are full of ways in which women have been maimed, women have been petrified, women have been mutilated, women have been set on fire, and so on and so forth. So it is really the constitution that is the visionary document. It is imagining a future which is quite different from anything that we have known. And therefore, the appeal to the Supreme Court, and therefore, however small that number is, Women who have fought for the entry to uh, Shabrimala are indeed not only fighting to assert their faith and to express their belief, but also for a new kind of society. Thank you.